last thing I wanted to do was to go back to second division. I suppose we survived, like all peoples who are under pressure, by drawing closer together and drawing strength from each other. No one got disheartened. We all knew that sooner or later we would prevail. I was playing rugby league with South Sydney. I met Ellie on the ferry one day. We were talking football. I was telling him I was fairly disillusioned with rugby league. I was going to give the game away. And he said, why don't you come out and play with Ringa? And I said, well, who's Ringa? Back in 1963, the only Warringah was a council. The dream of a rugby union team was up against bureaucracy, envy, and politics. And there's Rick Black, the big prop for Warringah League. In the water. I'll be tested by the Reds. Listen to him. In the water. The 121st and first grade game this afternoon. The reserve grade is. Manly was a traditional club, only had four grades, and not everyone was going to get a game. I was a regular grade player with Manly, and I was running around Manly Oval. And I was approached by Mark Phillips, who was a Sir Matthews guy and a North Stain lifesaver. He informed me that he hadn't been graded and that the Sir Matthews footballers in the same predicament. And they were very disappointed and they wanted to play rugby. He wondered whether I could approach the Sir Matthews committee with the view of getting Sir Matthews to enter a sub-district team. Ellie Bennett has always been a straight talker, but more importantly, he became the Pied Piper, drawing in quality players. Bill Simpson said to me, have you ever heard of Second Division? The timing was perfect. Second Division had only just been resurrected. He said, would you get a list of the people who you think might be interested to play in such a team? The only people I talked to were people who weren't graded and weren't getting a game and Ellie made sure that none of those players were poached from any other team. At the next meeting of St Matthews, I was able to provide a list of just under 30 players, which seemed to be a goer. A lot of the people who attended became our foundation fathers. It was just like a piece of plywood, and it got strength in the diversity. It was a strong body of people who had rugby at heart. I started playing rugby with Ringer. I expected my mates to be playing down at Manly. However, they were all playing at this new club called Warringah. I followed them up Bitwater Road just to play rugby with my mates. And that's what Warringah Rugby Union Club was founded on, camaraderie. Bill was the founding president. The work that he did around the club made an impression. Even if you're the man at the top, you still do all the jobs that have to be done. Bill Simpson's dream was not only to play grade, but ensure a fast running game. So that's the sort of rugby that we endeavoured to play, which was enjoyable. Surf lifesaving clubs and their surf boats had built the resilience and teamwork that became the perfect training ground for this fledgling second division club. Collaroy Surf Club and South Narrabeen Surf Club have both started to provide players along with North Stain and St Matthews. Myself and a very good friend of mine, Paul Booth, were rowing surf boats at the time and we played a bit of rugby league. We ran into a guy called Keith Dixon, I think he was the treasurer at the time, and myself and Paul were given Ellie Bennett's name. And that was our start with Ringa Rugby Club. In the early days, McQueen, Booth, Jim McCann, that speed on those sort of bikes, if we could get the ball out there, it was good night. Now that Warringah was on its way, it needed a place 
to call home. But what a dump it was. North Narrabeen was pretty rough. We started off at Narrabeen School. There was a rugby ground there. There was a big brick building just right on the dead ball line. Scoring tries at that end was pretty dangerous, really. We did have a hill which comprised the sewage pits for the school, and so there was a hill formed there. That hill became shit hill. <laughs> yeah. Some, some people call it Dunny Hill, but it was really shit hill. It was a good viewing, <laughs> viewing place for the game. Unfortunately, Narrabeen Oval didn't have any lights, so the only time we could train was Sunday mornings. So after having a game on Saturday and rocking up next morning, it wasn't very pleasant. In 1969, we were luckily enough to make the grand final. The winners of that competition would go up to first division and the wooden spurners from first division would drop back. We played Port Hacking and we were beaten. We lost that in a pretty close game. The old cliche, we didn't take our chances and they did. They chose not to go up to first division. So the competition stayed as it was. Next year we met them again in the grand final and we beat them. And we chose to go up. We were set to make the big time and go to first division. And that's when the hype started to come out about the first game against Manly. So the stage was set for one of the fiercest rivalries of any team sport. In the 1970s, when we went to First Division, we met Manly at Manly Oval in the first round and gave them the fright of their life. From my perspective, I felt it was really important to stand up at the Fords because they were seen as being overawing. And you know, I would have hoped within the first couple of matches that players around Ringer realised that they weren't as tough as they said they were. And actually, they can be beaten. There was only three points in that game and they were the pretty gun side then. To me it was just another game, but for the local Warringah boys to play against Manly was an amazing experience. The whole point was to respect Manly and know how good they were and therefore know how much better we had to be if we are going to beat them. The half break and then the door slammed. Did a punch up over in the background with Pearl and Lees. And Page is trying to break them up. The flag is out against Manly. Manly clearly resented this new, brash upstart on their doorstep. Very heavy feeling between the two clubs in terms of competitiveness, particularly as they live in each other's backyard, so to speak. The passion and the rivalry between Moringa and Manly, you know, was just something out of his world. Clements. Playing against Manly was very personal. One of the reasons was so many of our players actually came from that Manly area. There was a lot of newspaper talk in the Manly Daily about how Manly's going to get Moringa and you know they owed them because they were a break away from Manly. You know, we were the poor cousins, second cousins. That's what they looked at us like. So when we were coming up against Manly, it was just, you know, everyone would just get so much anger, get fired up and just want to tear in and rip and roar. Up down by Pearl, swept by Black. Pretty solid, isn't it? It's full on. Take no prisoners, it was very violent, very tough, and the aggression, yeah, you had to take it, but you gave it back. It was the best day of the year. Their house, our house was even greater. Love to kick the shit out of them. Very passionate games. It'd always be that extra bit of niggle. If you found yourself on the bottom of a ruck, you knew that there was going to be a boot coming your way. Andrews, to frame. Solid tackle. Head high tackle, says the rep. There was always a lot of competition between the two clubs, whether it was at Manly over at Red Park, it was always going to be on one way or the other. Got it. Oh. 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 Holmes got it away, Felchier, and away he goes. We'll have a go. Felchier, Felchier oh. still. Felchier. Holmes, oh. Josh Holmes. They've got numbers here. They must keep it. Two Samae. Luke Holmes. Take it back about. Oh, oh, that's right. Adams around for his second. The <laughs> length of the field special. It doesn't get any better. It didn't take too many beers when we played Manly for the older members of both clubs to get into an argument over whether St Matthews was a Manly Junior Club 
or whether the players should be allowed to come to Warringah. And the crowd really coming to life, Trevor, in the second half. Warringah. Crowd really coming what a flag for me, Lee, I'd always be chased. I'd be chased all day by people from Ringa, and then I end up coming down to Ringa, and then there's vice versa, Manly, Manly people are chasing me. Conditions are quite cool, but the players now have really warmed themselves up and are getting into it, and we're starting to see a little bit of that local derby atmosphere. Both clubs have their fierce supporters, and because you can get really close to the sideline, they hold a position on the ground that is quite imposing. They read the programs and find out what your name is. They used to tear shreds off me. Hillbilly Hill over here is just the place to be on every Rats home game. If you're not over there on Hillbilly Hill, you're not getting all the entertainment. <laughs> As an opposing coach and player, the, the Rats in Shoot Shield, it's the greatest place to come. They have a great crowd, it's a really good amphitheatre. It's intimidatory. You come out here and got the hillbillies drunk on the other side of the hill giving it to you and really good feel and you know you're not only in for a torrid game but a good post-match. It's one of the better experiences in Shoot Shield rugby. I think the rivalry is a big part of what Shoot Shield and grassroots rugby is about. The enormity of those rivalries and the media attention, the crowds, the possible outcomes really puts us in a good place. It's one of the most enjoyable days to play in. The physicality, just throw everything out the window and just have a real crack. Getting into first division was one thing. Staying there was very different. The early days of first division, we were enthusiastic, but not good enough, not physical enough. We'd gone from being top of the tree to winning every match to starting to struggle. We could match good teams like Manly, but in the last 20 minutes or so, we were found wanting. I can remember getting hammered in a lot of games, not just on the scoreboard, but physically. The standard was obviously very high. In the very early 70s, I could see that there was spirit in the club, but not a lot of finesse. I can remember a couple of major beatings were given to Moringa. In those days, we were taking a bit of a flogging, and we are getting beat pretty easy every week. We were behind in scrums and in line-outs. Possession was a problem for us, and defence was a problem for us because we never had the ball. Coming up to first division, we were playing a running game. However, because we didn't have enough strength in the forwards and the backs, running it from our own goal line wasn't a good prospect, particularly in the first 10 minutes. So, unfortunately, Billy Simpson's idealistic approach to the game didn't pay off in first division. Although players were giving everything they had, they continued to struggle and faced relegation. But off the field, they were up against blatant bias. They kept changing the rules to ensure that Warringah went down. There was a playoff at the end of a season where the team that came last would have to drop back to second division. We didn't finish last, we came second last. So the powers to be said, oh, you blokes from the beaches, you surfers, we'll make it the bottom two teams will have to play off. On some occasions it was club championship points, other occasions it was first division points. When I joined Warringah was when they moved up into first division. I watched some of the tough games when the teams were being held together by Paul Booth, Harry Rainbow and Rod McQueen. It was a tough time. There was a lot of conjecture about Warringah saying are they good enough to stay in first division. I found that very hard because the last thing I wanted to do, particularly as a younger player then, was to go back to second division. I think four games into the competition, there were about 14 guys in the lower grades who left to go and play for North Stain. They made the decision that this was really too high a standard for their abilities. With a matter of one year, I went from being the youngest guy in the forward pack to being the oldest, because we had all these retirements. At one stage, there were 35 first grade players living in the Warringah Shire that were playing for other clubs. People weren't coming to us. But no one, no one got disheartened. We all knew that sooner or later we would prevail. Of all the times I'd had in Warringah, they were the most worrying. It was very, very intense and all I wanted to do is win and stay in First Division. But as we continued to lose the camaraderie, the morale really started to drop and we were going through some really tough times. Really bad, you know, worse than normal. 
it was raining and we were talking about how disappointed we were. And I turned to a man who was listening to us, Uncle Doug Leslie. And I said to him, Uncle Doug, what have we got to do to win? Doug was always at the games. He said, well, boys, you like the rats of Trebrook. And we said, what do you mean? And it was at that moment in the mid 70s when Moringa went from being the flannel flowers to the rats. He said, well, we had a lot of bad times in Tobruk, but we stuck together, we never gave up, and we always had hope. To my memory, it was KB Leslie who said, well, they'll have to call us the fucking green rats, won't they? The thing I do remember most was him pointing out, no, we're not talking about comparing one with the other. One group gave their lives, it was a totally different scenario. When we were on the committee, we set up a Rats of Tobruk Day here, and we invited all the rats of Tobruk and they used to come out and have a terrific day here and enjoy the football and be proud that our name came from them. We put the memorial up on the hill and we raised the flag in honour of them. Remember, you never give up. The old thing is that you do your best, stick by your mates and come out on top. A lot of people think it's the rats from the, the old tip, but it's not the rats of the old tip. It's because we've got ticker and we never give up. Reinvigorated by the powerful words of Uncle Doug Leslie, like their namesakes, the rats refused to surrender. So a new campaign to find experienced players was launched. Grant Andrews was the number one target. At that stage, it was a realisation. We had to actually build the club. We embarked on a process of trying to say to guys, just come and play for us, you'll have a really good time. Mark Holmes was at Eastwood, Barry Turner from North, Dave Pearl from North, John Watkins, who was from Sydney University, were all good footballers living locally, and obviously the doyen of 5'8's Grant Andrews. Grant Andrews was asked, why did you come to Warringah? He said, because Harry Rainbow kept ringing me and I just wanted him to stop. <laughs> the bastard wouldn't get off the phone to me. He'd ring me every week to try and get me to play with the rats and uh, I was pleased that I did. Andrews, field goal from 40 metres out. Oh, what a lovely kick. Grant Andrews has levelled the scores. Well, <laughs> there's no doubt about him. And he wants to pop field goals and in a confident mood he can really pop him and that one was from a long way out. All those guys were young and enthusiastic so it really started to build what we needed. The time was right. We had a mix of young guys that have come through the local area with some experienced guys that brought some temper to that. While players started flooding in from the local area and beyond, the Rats now set their sights on the road ahead. A significant turnaround came when John Francis became our coach. One of the things that we talked about is the importance of having the same style of football that we knew at the time, so Johnny Francis seemed like a good fit. He had a tremendous CV. He was a very likeable person. He brought a bit more variation to the game, a bit more professionalism, strategy and tactics. As the years went on, more and more players were attracted to the club, and that was a damn good thing. And slowly but surely, Things were improving. Knocked down by Quiller. Knocked forward by Walsh. Chance for Mark Andrews. Tim Ryan. Oh, it could have had it in his own hands. Up on top of it and over. Well, he nearly bombed that twice, but it came up with a great net result. Then in 1976, the Rats found the leader they needed to transform the club. Their inspiration was Tony Slaggy Miller. Probably one of the hardest men around, Slaggy Miller. But a great effort from Moringa. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom.
Tony Miller was a great guy, a big tough man. He had a heart of gold, but he was fiery. He was hard-edged, old-school rugby man, loved his rugby, loved the blokes around him. He'd be training and always come home with scratches and bleeding and everything off his face. To attract Slaggy to our club was a coup. When John retired, Slaggy was having a few issues with Manly. A bit of bad blood down there, I think, and he didn't end up getting the coaching job. I approached Slaggy and he said he was interested. That's how he ended up venturing down to Ringer Rugby Club, and he never looked back. The influence that Slaggy Miller had on the club was really defining in the formation of our culture. He had a wide experience in the rugby world and was generally revered. Slaggy Miller was a great mentor. He could talk to the backs as well, even though he didn't really like backs that much. But he still had enough knowledge to be able to talk to us, and he was a great hard man. And he was quite funny at times. He could crack a joke or two, which I really appreciated. Tony really made the boys train. He instilled confidence in them. He took traditionalists off our back. We were still quite young. Slaggy was able to turn that around on us and helped us believe in ourselves, make up for the lack of ability and talent we had with just raw enthusiasm and a robust style of play. He was someone that you knew bled for rugby, the sort of person that you want as a coach. He brought an understanding that the opposition was not always your enemy, that there were good people there and that we should enjoy their company. Always had a lot of purpose about it. Guys, this is what we do. We put the green and white on and we take it to them. The whole game, no prisoners, and we just give it to them. He charged everyone with the responsibility of once you put the green jumper on and you walked across the stripe, you had to do your best and nothing else was acceptable. After the game, a very husky, a man who's been through the flu all through the week, but he certainly was feeling well once he spoke to me. Tony Miller, the Warringah coach, was absolutely elated with the result. Here's what he had to say. Well, it's interesting today, you didn't have the, the husky voice to be able to give the tongue lashing at half time. Do you think they might have relished the fact that they didn't get such a lashing as they did last week against Gordon? Well, I didn't think they needed it. Uh, I just thought they were playing well. They were winning a lot of possession from rucks and balls going forward, and their line-out was good, and their scrum was good. I said to them before we went on that we must keep possession away from Ramwick, and once we keep possession away from Ramwick, you know, Ramwick are no good without the ball. He taught you the physicality of the game and if you got setbacks to get back up and keep on going and I think that was a hallmark of Rats Rugby. It was never say die, you are never beaten and I think Slaggy initiated a lot of that. Yeah, no, a great, um, a great era back in those days, Slaggy Miller. I remember him very fondly as a, uh, a very hard man, a hard coach running out against Manly. He uh, told us, you know, We've got to keep it clean, no penalties, let's just play hard rugby, throw the ball around. And uh, as the backs ran out of the change room, he stopped us all and said to the forwards, what I just said, don't take any notice of that. Get into these bastards and rip shit out of them. Of course, coming to Warringah, you came to a family. The patriarch was Slaggy Miller, Tony Miller. Slaggy, as hard as he was, always had a soft spot and encouraged the balance between footy, family life and work and including the wives and kids and everything that we did. I can still remember him saying, if the women are happy, you're happy, so make sure you make them happy. Of course, with Tony, you also got Joyce, the girls, and Robbie, who played here as well. Joyce was very involved in the club. She was like the mum of all the boys that played down here. He treated us as his boys. Any of the events that occurred around the club, Slaggy was central of that and ensured that we enjoyed a family-type atmosphere. He was like a dad to me because I was in the Navy, in the services, and every time I come back, Slaggy always had a place for me. You couldn't ask a better forward coach, and Slaggy is my idol in rugby. He was a legend. He started that very close-knit mateship amongst the boys. It was like a brotherhood. We all played together, had our downtime together, and all the families mixed in together, and it's still happening today. Because he had that presence as a man, and he had that expectation that you were a man as well. And you know, at that stage we had some really young backs coming through. How did you think of your centres today, Tony? Well, you know, they're only babies, really. I think they're babies. They're, they're what, 22, 23. And they're playing against Berkey, who's, what, at 18. You know, it's pretty young, and uh, uh, they've got years ahead of them. You know, I think they're great centres myself. I think they should be, Sydney should be looking at, at them, you know, although there's a lot of talent around. Tony, you're obviously well entrenched towards uh, your first semi-final. It'll be a big year if you can have your first Wallaby and your first semi-final in one season. 
Oh, yes, I agree. I, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, I, I was set my goals last year to get in the semis, uh, but I think we're good enough to get into the uh, grand final, personally. If we're on our day, you know, we're, we're, we just probably haven't got enough discipline without in ourselves to uh, play week in, week out, a constant good game. You've got your foot in the door. Well, that's the main thing. That's I right. agree. The thing that came home for me really clearly was Slaggy could have put himself aside for it and said, yeah, they're going to be OK in the future, etc. But he didn't. He said, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. We're working really hard. And, you know, we really believe we're going to get this out from day one. Tony Miller put his name to the club and was part of it. That was a mark of the man, and that's what he brought to Ringo, which I thought was so special. He taught many of these young men what it means to be not only a good footballer, about being a man who has respect for himself and respect for others, and most importantly for his family. Why have you anyone to forsake you found out who was doing the wrong thing by, by their family? You, you didn't last long with him. I based a lot of my life around how he approached it, and between my father and him, I think they've set me up for how I am as a person now these days. That's what made Ringo Rugby Club. Slaggy Miller and the guys around him set the benchmark and the culture. If you want to be part of Ringo Rugby Club, certainly back in those days, you had to be a tough person. I wasn't tough. <laughs> yeah, we've got a long way to go yet, and uh, five more games, and by the time we get round to the bigger games, uh, I think we'll be a good unit. Thanks to a coach like Slaggy and players like Grant Andrews, the Rats were now firmly established. By 1978-79, it was time for fully operational club facilities. We had people in the club who were always thinking 10 years ahead. They had a plan to not only survive, but to continue to prosper. One of the problems a lot of the clubs have is they don't have a proper ground. One of the requirements going to First Division is we had to get a First Division ground. So we approached the Warringah Shire Council. Gave away our brochures, we worked very hard for the election of the council. It was a tremendous job. We got a 30-year lease of North Narrabeen Reserve to build a rugby facility there. We decided to make it a showpiece for rugby. People like Bill and Nellie were saying, we need to build a grandstand. Warringah Rugby Park is actually a rugby park. The majority of fields in Sydney were ovals. The thing I remembered particularly about that early time was the amount of women that were involved. The wives and the kids would be down here, they'd be painting the sheds from first grade all the way down to fifth grade in Colts. It was a total undertaking to get it right. We'd play on Saturday and then on Sunday we'd be here digging trenches all day to lay the cables. It wasn't great but it was fun and we enjoyed it and of course we always ended up with a few beers at the end of the day. You got that sense there were some people here trying to do something and to actually go there and think, you know, this is a group of people who are enjoying life. I suppose that was part of the motivation to hop in the car and become a rat. In the early days, I was a very good mate with Vince Beakey, who became the groundsman. One day during the week, I came down from work at lunchtime and a fellow, an Italian, rocked up in this truck, walked over to said, look, I've got some fill. Would you guys be interested? I could sort of make a hill over there for you. Vince was there at the time and he said, look, I think we could do that. What we didn't realise, it wasn't one truck, the truck just kept coming. So that hill just happened so quickly. And I don't recall getting council approval, but it was, uh, it, was, it was great to see how the hill sort of came. And as it turned out, it worked out really well because it obviously blocked out a lot of the wind. And so that was a special time. We are starting to make a ground of it. It took a lot of hard work. They made this magnificent oval out of a tip. We had two fields out the front and one here. And our dressing shed was the pony shed on the edge of the thing. When we put the first goalpost in, we thought we were pretty special until the first wind came and then we had this amazing goalpost that had this circular motion and got bigger and bigger as it went. So it was a bit of a laughing stock at that time. It became our home. Hello everyone and it's a beautiful day here at Warringah Rugby Park. As you can see, the ground on the far side is pretty thick, but more so in the grandstand. The ground itself, well, it's in the pink of condition. People from everywhere came. There was a, a wonderful game between uh, Warringah Invitational 15 and Barbarian side. We were honoured that Roden Cutler was here to open the ground. Part of the fact it was a great game of football, it was actually a statement to all of Sydney rugby that Warringah was here to stay. My for Warringah was Bruce Robertson, who was the current outside centre for the All Blacks. He certainly showed what a great player he was that day. It was a wonderful day for rugby in Warringah Shire.
A statement about this is what First Division Rugby should look like was very powerful. That made a huge difference to the club and we never looked back after that. Well, there's nothing quite like rugby, or like a rugby man. A little bit rough, a little bit tough, watch it if you can. Hello there, thank you for joining me for the first of our club rugby matches under the big thorn lights from Redfern Oval. Captain of 5'8", number 10, Grant Andrus, has been more instrumental in Warringah's surge to first division than any other player. A very shrewd reader of the game with a deft boot, Andrews dictates play like a chess grand master. Really got stuck into Randwick that night. Warringah will expect a continuation of the grand form number 8, Mark Holmes, has been displaying of late. He's been an inspiration to a pack which gets better each week. Ramwick kicking off from left to right in the white shorts and solid jumper, green in colour for those of you not in colour T uh, in the colour TV, black and white. It was one of the most exciting nights I've played for the Rats. Lock forward again, number eight, Mark Holmes picks it up. There could be a try. Oh, beautiful hands from uh, Grant Andrews. Absolutely beautiful hands there. Started on fire, we finished on five. Typically, we're into the underdogs. We use that as a bit of an ambush on Ramwick. Came out there with guns blazing and and put 40 points on them before they knew what happened and it was a really entertaining game. Vaughan, switch of play back to the blind, right through he'll score, surely. Must be there. A good Being a such young club against a strong uh, Ramwick team and getting up, it was such a wonderful night for Warringah. What's the blind? Ready? Ready? Now Warringah in the scrum. Davis is surging forward, taking a power of pulling down too. He's got to within about three metres of the line. Ringer forwards taking charge. The driver's on. Over the line, and it's a try. A driving try, pushed into the end goal and forced the ball. That's good stuff. It is tremendous stuff. It's Mark Holmes. I think it's Holmes. The performance has been a great one by Holmes. The lock forward. One try, especially remember. They were hard on the tack. They dropped the ball. I picked up the ball around 60 metres. Opportunity now for Warringah with a drop pass. As away they come, up towards the halfway line, there'll be the kick ahead as number nine, Dominic Vaughan, finally gets the pass away to number 11, Zappa. Zappa's cut midfield. A long floating pass out there to Steve Temple. Temple's sprinting hard, he'll probably go close to scoring. Gets the pass away, finally to, da to Davidson, and Davidson's in for a length of the field try. Highly spectacular stuff. That was a big step for the Rats. You know, it was showcased Sydney rugby on the TV on Friday at prime time and put Warringah on the map by defeating Ramwick by such a good score. That was a really entertaining game. Tonight's Man of the Match award has a retail value of over $2,500. It comes with the compliments of National Panasonic and the Electronic Sales and Rentals. The award will go to the Players Club. Well, the award winner we've decided on, number eight, Mark Holmes, the Warringah lock forward. Had a, a game in which a very good try came his way. He had great mobility around the field, defended very stoutly, mauled well, I thought put a very strong imprint on the game. I told everyone I didn't take it, but I had it for a long time at home. This is Rex Mossop for David Lord, hoping you join us again next Friday at 9.30. By the early 80s, any team playing at Rat Park knew it wouldn't be a picnic. And Moringa with their young cheer squad. It's a pretty impressive lineup this year with Rodriguez number three there in the front row. Uh, my, this Rodriguez is a mobile prop forward, Trevor. Yes, he's quite surprising. He is quite quick. Um, he's right at the front of the line out now. That's him. Very strong man, as you can see. Well built, tremendous shoulders and chest. Very quick around the field. Playing with Sydney or with New South Wales or the Wallabies, they knew that when they came to Warringah, it was a hard yakka. They had to really roll up the sleeves and put in. Coming into Rat Park one day, behind Ramwick, a couple of their forwards were in front of me and they said, not this again. <laughs> and I knew exactly what they were talking about because they just got hammered in the forwards that day. Crawford number six for Ramwick. And I think he's in trouble. Yeah, there seemed to be some pretty solid crash there. And there oh. it is there. Yes, there was a head-high tackle and well hit. Uh, and the Randwick player was on the end of it. Numero uno. <laughs> but he's coming off the field, so he really copped another one. Well, that's been a bad day for him, really has. I would call it a team of presence. When Warringah took the field, 
the opposition knew. Warringah's consistent, fierce attacking style earned it a spot in the 1982 semi-final up against Manly. Warringah forwards have certainly put on a fantastic first half effort. And here they go again. That's uh, great work from the far lighter and less experienced Warringah pack. A wall of players. A wall of players and what a try! Well, that was almost like the up the comfort trick because no one knew where the ball is. But he certainly won't have a harder kick than this one. Stuck it all right. Oh, what a kick! Oh, and that has put the icing on the cake. And there it is! And a history making win during now! Their first grand final in history, and in fact that's two for today. Their fourth grade being the first to get in, but now it's first grade for the grand final to Warringah. Winners by 18 points to 13 over minor premiers and neighbours Manly. And what a great win for Tony Miller, Grant Andrews and the boys. And Warringah Rugby Park has never seen anything like it. The 1982 grand final against Randwick was always going to be a tough one. In 1982 we played Randwick at the old sports ground and was one of the last grand finals there. In the 1982 grand final with Eddie Whaling kicking off for a winger running from left to right and running into a very stiff nor'easterly. And up against their own inexperience and several wallabies, the fairy tale was not to be. Ball loose now with Andrews. Davidson fumbles it, still going, reaches the quarter. And Winger had control of that and then lost it. I think we're a little bit overwhelmed by the whole event. The Ellers were pressuring us. Noddy Sawtell, or Rob Sawtell, got his head split open and I went on to replace him. Brad Andrews doing the same thing as Mark Eller, finding touch. Behind him, Raven, skipper. Andrews, what a stupid, stupid thing to do from Mark Andrews. And Boydeman's over for the try with not a hand being laid on him. And if ever that was tossing away all the good lead-up work in 14 minutes, that's the perfect example. Bruce Maloof, knocked down by Pearl. Born Andrews, cut out to Wailing. On to Simon Wood, Wood towards the halfway mark, looking for Topham, Topham sets sail, coming towards the quarter line, chips in field, Davidson's coming to it, Ryan can't get to it and Davidson knocks it on. Oh, there the big chance for Warringah. Randwick seemingly having much more penetration in the backs when they get the ball. Warringah have had their opportunities but they seem to be lining very wide and flat and they're relying on cutouts and long passes and making it difficult for themselves. When you analyse it, Warringah have done just about everything right today except score the point. The 1982 grand final was the one that got away. Frustration galore creeping into Warringah down by 21 points to 6 and time a wasting. Brad Andrews chipping to the corner for Ward. Ward! There! Super work from Brad Andrews and beautifully taken by Simon Wood. That's the ball game and Randwick win their record fifth premiership in a row with a three tries to one victory winning by 21 points to 12 and indeed worthy victors. But Warringah certainly not disgraced in their first grand final in its history. We'll see more of Warringah in future years. Yeah, it was a great effort by the guys to get going like the way we did and Blackie and the guys really got stuck into it. They did extra well, you know, I was very proud of them they stuck in and Rick especially because he caught one in the ribs and had to have an injection at half time and it was uh, a great effort on his part to stay on. You know, the pace of the game was really uh, incredible. At 6-0 I still thought we had a chance but unfortunately they scored uh, straight after. If we had taken those couple of opportunities it could have been a different result right now I guess. It was just one of those things that makes rugby the game it is. And unfortunately we all have to wear the mistake but I think with that sort of experience under their belt they can only benefit by it. Yeah it's been a fantastic year uh, all around. I really think this club's on the verge of greatness. No doubt about it. The guys have got plenty of guts and determination. We're never ever going to give in. We'll never ever give in in any game and uh, that's just a, a facet of character of this club. But it wasn't all bad news on the day. Out of the determined crop of players emerged Warringah's first Wallaby, 
Dominic Vaughan. In any good team, you need a person with initiative, a bit of a leadership, and we had Dominic Vaughan. Early 80s, he had the best pass in Australia. Dom played for the Waratahs in Newcastle, quiet, a sort of unassuming guy, but a very good player and a, a good companion. We've always been battlers and while we're up there mixing it with the best, we could never seem to get players into the Wallabies. And I remember bemoaning the fact to Bob Dwyer, who was a Wallaby coach, his answer was, yeah, you're nearly there. 1982, out of the blue, I was picked as Ringer's first Wallaby. I can still remember the day. As usual with the rats down here, it was a barbecue and I wandered in late. Walking down the hill, I started to get clapped. And I thought, oh, I'm always late, but I didn't expect to get a clap for being late today. And that's how I found out I'd got selected for the Wallabies. Not through a phone call, but by the boys at the Rats. The club got behind me a lot, supporting me, looking after me, helping me out, getting to and from. And it takes a lot of time and dedication and effort being a Wallaby. And it wasn't for the ring of support. I don't think I would have ever played for the Wallabies. Andrews. Combi. Regain. Andrews. Overlap. Bloomfield. Glen Eller in front. Must be a try. Dominic Ford. Little Dominic Ford. The test halfback. The current test halfback has put Moringa well and truly into the lead. Despite making the grand final in 1982, the Rats continued their success, but were unable to secure that final frontier of winning the shoot shield. But over the years, lower grades and the Colts all won premierships, including five consecutive second grade premierships. But the grand prize still eludes the Rats. What I really enjoyed about playing at Ringer was the camaraderie and the much and the opportunity to meet great people, great characters. Steve Temple, Rick Black, Cole Scully, Alan Lowe, Dennis White. Real characters of men that made your week interesting. You know, when I bump into them, it's like a brother that you haven't seen for a couple of years, you know, you're sort of used to the patterns and the nuances and, and this and that. And they're the great memories I've got at the club. Meeting those guys and being with those guys and being really good friends with those guys. Arriving in Sydney was a big change to be playing um, or being based in the northern beaches was different than being based in the Scottish borders. It took a little while getting used to it, but it was very aligned to my personality and also the way I wanted to play the game. I went in on a loose ball, as I was taught to do by my dad as a young bloke and always did. I felt I was easy target for the opposition boots. I needed to hear this voice over the top of me of Mark O'Brien as he flew in over and took the punishment for me to say, I've got you Mickey. Don't worry, as a 30-something year old, to have an 18-year-old run over the top and, and, and cover me up meant that the legacy of the blokes who had come before had been well and truly passed on and I was playing for a club who would never leave a mate out on his own. There was an understanding when you crossed that line, you were out to play tough rugby. The forward pack seemed to always go out there looking for a very good performance, but also getting a fight in in those 80 minutes, and they'd be disappointed if there was a game without a fight. I fondly remember the after-match festivities, getting up on the bar and those speeches and the opposition team staying and, you know, making a night of it. And I remember them mostly for the sportsmanship, really, because after the games, we were all together, we all shared a beer, all shared a laugh, and a great time, and not very respectful on the field, but off the field it was. That was rugby in the 80s. They were irreplaceable, those. And, geez, we used to really have a beer. Especially when we had to work behind the bar. Mick Shahady made his first grade debut and he ran on the field, he was excited. And I think Steve Temple standing behind him, talking to him, and you could see Steve bend over. And next minute, he's vomited all over Mick Shahady's back. And I turned around to Mick and said, welcome to first grade. You can see it when you come down. They're a tight bunch of blokes. 
and that comes back to the culture of the club. The boys can put away a beer and I think that's just the good thing about footy mate, that's the great thing about rugby and what club rugby is about. It's gone professional and it's changed and it's grown but there's still those things and that's the things that make rugby great. The minute I walked in the gate I felt like part of the family and I've been treated like part of the family ever since. There was a real club feel from fifth, sixth grade all the way through to first grade and I think that's what made the, the, the club so special. A lot of clubs are very first grade, second grade kind of orientated, but Warringah had 150 blokes you could have a beer with after the game, so I think that was a very important part of what the Rats culture brought into it. It was all for one. One game for the Rats, your whole life for the Rats. Everyone feels a part of this club. It was a family. Everyone was on the same level. Everyone talked to everyone. Everyone came and supported the other teams. The fact that they get to connect, build relationships and not be up in a grandstand but actually be in a clubhouse and have a beer with the guy after and their kids meet the players, I think that's special. The club's got a, just a fantastic atmosphere, it always has. It's a very family orientated club. That's what brought me to it and that's what's kept me here. It's a big part of my life and my family's life. It's very special to me, I feel very proud to represent the club. It's a lot more than just what happens on the field. There's togetherness, there's a toughness. Players that played for other teams and they knew going up to Rat Park was always going to be tough. It was a tight-knit group. One of the things that really impressed my wife was she had left a club where the first grade wife sat together, the second grade wife sat together. She came to Warringah and there was wives and girlfriends, it didn't matter who you were, and there were players. Women generally were very important in Warringah Club. And not only did the Rats acknowledge the crucial support of grandmothers, wives, sisters, daughters, but Warringah became the first Sydney club to introduce a women's rugby team. Back then there was really no women's rugby league or anything like that. There was still all the fear around injuries and it being acceptable for women to play. It was netball or nothing. You can't live in the past and ignore 50% of the population. The committee after debate said they would do it on the condition that the women only got what the guys got. There was no favourites. This was just what the women's group wanted. Of the more senior members who didn't uh, really enjoy it, my stock reply was, the girls drink as much as the guys, they pay their subs on time, and they're much better looking. The club seemed very supportive. I know that some key people were really keen to have a women's team be part of the club. The likes of Ellie Bennett as just our absolute male champion. If Ellie said that the girls could do this, well then pretty much the rest of the club said that the girls could do whatever. After a very wet and torrid afternoon at Eastern Suburbs, we went to go in for these speeches. East's told us that the women couldn't come in. I told the East guys, if our women weren't coming in, we were going up to the local pub. If they wanted to come and have a beer with us, they were very welcome. They relented and as soon as the ring ladies went in, the Eastern Suburbs ladies went in. Any change in roles is challenging to the majority. So a lot of men thought that it was just a phase that we were going through and that we would maybe go away and lose interest. That was never going to be the case. I just knew that Warringah would be one of the best clubs in the country. It became a vehicle for people and young women to really discover themselves and play a sport that they've wanted to play for a long time and really enjoy it. Just like the men had Slaggy, the women were now inspired by Rob Noddy Sawtill. Noddy, Noddy, Noddy. The most significant influence in my rugby career. <laughs> as a friend, as a rugby mentor, as a coach, as a father, as a brother that you just want to get in a headlock. He was the man. Rob Sawtell now on the field. Noddy, as he's known to teammates. Ringer, very fortunate. Trevor, they can call on someone of his experience and ability. Noddy was really a presence in women's rugby, not just at Ringer, but through the state and the country. He changed a lot of girls' lives. He put women's rugby onto the agenda for the ARU, for clubs such as Warringah, for schools. He showed women how good that they were and how proud they should be about what they were doing. As we developed into a proper team, we got better fast. 2003, we won our first grand final out at Lidcombe Oval against West Harbour. To take a team that came from schoolgirls and developed within itself with the whole support of the club was just a really great experience and that camaraderie attracted other players to come in and want to be part of the Rats. When we first became aware that the Rugby Sevens would form part of the Rio Olympics, I thought how marvellous that one day we could have an honour board showing Olympians. And who would have thought that soon there'd be two Warringah Ratettes 
holding gold medals from the Rio Olympics. It's a surreal feeling to watch the flag being raised and looking at our families right in front of us with tears of joy. Standing up on the podium in that moment, you just realise that every single thing was worth it. In fact, the club has run a successful sevens program for years, including winning the prestigious Kiama Sevens numerous times and a number of players representing Australia. The foundation of any successful rugby club is its investment in their juniors. Colts is where it all starts. That's everybody's first experience for a club. Manly had already formed teams to play in this competition. And so I formed with others up the Colts Warringah side, comprising two teams. We worked really hard to develop the Colts to become the next generation of great players. Colts was a fantastic experience. We had a good mix of personalities. It was quite a few of us all finding our way in the world. Just immediately struck up a great friendship. Guys from a range of different backgrounds who were really passionate about the field. And that was flowing down from the senior ranks as well into the Colts. It was just all about footy. Your mates were trained against first grade guys and just get beaten up, but we thought that was awesome. It was such a lovely experience to go and play my first trial match for the Rats. Play a bit of fourths, a bit of thirds, a bit of seconds, and someone even threw me on for the last few minutes of first, and I just felt indebted to the club from there forward. To take that spirit and great community feel it has and make sure that all the good Warringah Juniors in this area, they're not driving past us to play for other clubs. They're, they're here and they're proud to be Warringah Rats. I remember the first day that I rolled in to Warringah Colts training. first man I met as I walked into the club was Ellie Bennett and he put out his hand and said, G'day Geno, how are you? I had no idea who he was. I asked my mate, who's, who's that? He's like, Ellie Bennett, mate, he's the legend of the club. My son Tom has said he wants to come down here next year and have a go at, at where I started off in the Colts and see if he can make his way and get a couple of runs, which I'm unbelievably proud and pleased about. Colts was definitely pretty fun on the field, but probably more fun off the field. It was a great time to be involved with the club. From that, we produced future Wallabies, future Super 15 players. But if you were to speak to those men now, they wouldn't talk about winning a game. They'd talk about the friendship they built up over a long time. Obviously, the strength of the club lies within the juniors. It's where your playing base starts and finishes. So if you keep fostering the juniors like we have been over the years, if you can progress them to the next level, we're doing our job. And the talent that is coming through and has been coming through for the last couple of decades is amazing. Stand on the shoulders of the largesse and the generosity and the openness of these sponsors. We've had three families of sponsors. We've had Peninsula Holden, Dilip Kumar was one of our original founding sponsors. Dilip put 10 years into the club. He helped us out quite a lot. Cole Crawford Motors has come on board a long time ago. The company really saw what the club was doing and where it was going and the good people around it. So it was natural to get involved with the club. Between Cole Crawfords and Bayfields, we've been the major or second string sponsor. The great Bayfield family. Neville Bayfield asked me to step up to become president in 2005. He was a very tough but very astute businessman who set very high expectations. 1990, Steve War ran out and asked me to coach Ringer Colts. I went out and I had a meeting with Neville Bayfield. I said, can I get $5,000 sponsorship? He said, come back tomorrow and I'll have an answer. Well, I turned up the next day and he gave me a cheque for $25,000. Without those three family sponsors, this club wouldn't be here. They've always supported us with jobs, advice, direction. We're truly blessed to have those sponsors in particular over the last 50 years, but there are others. And whether it's taking a fence sign or becoming a friend of Ringa, they all contribute to our success. They're the people that allow the first grade to be the best they can be, and our ladies to be the best they can be, and a cult to be the best they can be, and a fourth grade the best they can be. And that's what pulls it all together. It's our extended family. My mum and dad came to every single game. They loved it. They loved the family atmosphere. And I remember one game, they drove from Jindabyne to Rat Park, watched the game. After every game, my father would come into this very change room and say, any injuries? Good stuff, see you soon. And then they drove 
back to Jindabyne to continue their ski holiday. When I came to Oringa, I obviously bought my dad. He's still a member and he's still a club sponsor. And then my two sons who used to sit on my shoulder and sit in the change room and love singing the song after the game. And then my grandsons are playing rugby now and they don't miss a match. I think that's probably why all the friendships have lasted so long. I come down here and watch a game of football and I'll see faces way back from the 80s. We all come here and support the club. It was a real thrill playing in front of our home crowd because there were thousands here. And that was something that Moringa had over a lot of other teams, a wonderful supporter base. The club had this aura about it. I mean, everybody in the area knew Warringah Rugby Club. We're very lucky and very unique that a lot of our playing group and a lot of the support staff, everything we have, are all locals. And I think that's one of the beauties of what our club has to offer. I was born 200 that way, grew up 300 metres that way, went to school 100 metres that way. I'm not going anywhere. Once I retire, I'll be back here helping the club out as best I can in any way I can. The fact we outdraw every other club in the shoot shield is no fluke. We've managed over the years to build up this tribalism in the community that sustains us in difficult years and rewards us in the good years. It's one thing accepting financial support from sponsors, but Warringah Rugby has always given back to our community, just like it did with the Bushfire Sevens fundraiser in 1994. A nervous night ahead for New South Wales, with fears that searing heat and strong winds will whip bushfires into a new frenzy. Yeah, the fire's up there, get out now! Uh, this fire's about to jump Motorbar Road into the Ingleside Road area. Do you have another truck that can... Anybody who lived in the northern beaches at that time recalls it was close to wartime, as many of us all have get. All units are to pull out and make safe. I repeat, all units are to pull out and make it safe. There were people living in these change rooms. There were stock down here from people up on the Duffy Forest area that had been burnt out. It's wild now. This sounds like a steam train roaring down the hill. It is finally hit. Most rewarding thing about the night was John Eels. I contacted him and told him what we were trying to do. And you have to appreciate Bushfire Severs was organised in about three weeks. He said, no problem. I'll come down, I'll bring a few of the boys with me and we'll pay our airfares if you just put us up somewhere. So that night of the bushfire sevens to see John Eels running around and the atmosphere that prevailed at the time was just marvellous. It reflects that community support we've always enjoyed. I know a lot of people still today who talk about that night of the bushfire sevens and uh, how successful it was. I uh, didn't sleep very well that night because John Eels spent the night in Monavale Hospital. It still reminds me about it when I see him occasionally. By the mid-80s, as insightful as ever, Slaggy knew who he wanted to replace him as coach, Rod McQueen. But no one had any idea just how good Slaggy's decision would prove to be. After a successful but disappointing 85 season, Tony Miller retired. The grounding was set by Slaggy in amalgamating the experienced guys and that robust style of play. Rod McQueen was in the wings course, he'd come on board and was coaching reserve grade and we could see that a new era in Ringer Rugby was about to start. At some stage Slaggy said, why don't you look at coaching? So I thought, well, I'll put my name up for the Colts and Slaggy said, no, look, I either want you to help me or will you take on second grade? Rod's legacy for the club was the professionalising of the game well before the game became professional. At that stage we maybe played a bit more with brawn than our brains. Talked about being the best team and club in Sydney. He could see where the game was heading, started to think outside the square in terms of tactics, methodology and beating teams, which was new. Why can't we do things differently just because they've been done like this? And it's probably been something I've always done, whether it's right or wrong. Challenging the status quo. Brought in fitness coaches, specialist coaches. One of the more controversial ones was coming up with a pattern of play that everyone did. It took a bit of time for all of us to get our head around it. You know, we turned up to training with reams of paper. I was unbelievably lucky to be able to play rugby for Rod McQueen, who I think is probably the best coach Australia has been lucky enough to have. Yes, he knew the game. Yes, he was passionate. But he was so organised and so professional and so dedicated to doing what was best for this club. He did a very good job of making people come together as one. Whether you were playing first, second, third, fourth, fifth or sixth grade, you'd have a strong interest in the team that played before you, your team and then the team after as well. 
He had the ability to be really honest. I remember he rang me up once and said, we should have lunch. I thought, fantastic, how good is this? I'm going to have lunch with Rod McQueen, this is terrific. And as soon as we sat down to have lunch, he said, you really didn't play very well on the weekend. I need more from you. And I thought, wow, how honest and how ballsy and upfront is that to look someone in the eye and say, mate, you didn't play well. And you can bet the next weekend, when I ran onto the field, I was thinking that I needed to pull my socks up. The most enjoyable day I had at Moringa was the day we found out that we couldn't lose the club championship. It was a pretty special time, and that was a really good thing for me because I wasn't someone that really looked back. It made me understand more than ever how much Moringa had actually given me. But in 1988, Warringah lost its adored patriarch, Tony Miller, MBE. Slaggy was dead at only 58. When Slaggy passed away, it was like losing a father. Slaggy was a wonderful influence on our club, a wonderful guy. He was part of us. It really was a great loss for the whole community. His life ended a bit early didn't get to finish what he started out to do. The name of the prestigious award for the best and fairest player in the Shoot Shield has changed several times over the years, from the Herald Cup to the Rothmans Medal to the more recent Ken Catchbolt Medal. The Rats have had a proud tradition in winning this coveted award starting with Grant Andrews in 1979 more recently with three-time winner Hamish Angus. When rugby turned professional in the 90s, most of the top players became unavailable for their clubs. As a result, crowds dwindled and the clubs struggled to survive. There was this massive pressure on all the local clubs to start producing wallabies. The beginning of the real pressure was the advent of Super Rugby generally, when the top players started to disappear from the Sydney competition. In one year we were raided by one particular club. We'd already lost two or three of our first graders. We had to come up with something to stop the rot and keep the club strong. I remember being called down to a meeting and Ronnie Curry, who was the president at the time, wanted to pay the players. We're all getting paid 500 a win. At one stage, I think we were 12 out of 12. The club came to us and the budget's already been reached in the first half of the season. Deals would be done with clubs, with sponsorship. We wouldn't do that. We would do it by the book. And we were probably the first club to pay them above the table. We as a club had to follow that trend. And it became a real problem for us because once money becomes involved, players become mercenaries. So we found this real disparity between the clubs because you had the really wealthy clubs and you had the clubs that weren't so wealthy. Warringah Rats was now at a crossroads. It decided to return to its grassroots, giving back to the community. Only this time, going on tours overseas to do it. After discussions with board, we decided that we would re-enter the touring phase of the club. The one that would resonate, it would be Kenya. First tour, we tied up with Oasis Africa and an organisation called St John's College, which was an orphanage inside Kibera in Nairobi. Kibera is the largest urban slum in North Africa. One million people squeezed into three square kilometres. No running water, no toilet facilities. 60% of the kids in there have been sexually assaulted. HIV is running rampant, the whole box and dice, and we supported this little school inside there. And we combined that with rugby. We donated a library, we've donated a bridge. We ran rugby clinics, we played two games, we played against the Kenya A team, we played against the Harlequins, but the most important part of the tour, we went into this slum. Most blokes walked away with tears in their eyes that day. They told us, these kids are really dirty, whatever you do, try not to touch them. But within five minutes of being in there, Everybody's picking these kids up, playing footy with them, doing whatever needed to be done. On the last day of the tour, we gave the kids chuppa chups. And one of the boys, Big Ben Adams, turned around and his little comment was, I just wish a lollipop could make me that happy. You don't go away as first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. You go away as one big club. But living here on the Northern Beaches, it puts your life here into perspective. 
Going back to square one proved monumental, bringing the club closer than ever across all grades. Warringah was well and truly prepared for the 2000s. It's Warringah's grasp for glory, inspired by the muscle of men like Hugh Willoughby. And the experience of their captain and lock, Cameron Trelaw. Ground looks superb, doesn't it? And the scene is set for a mighty battle here. The seventh time of asking for Warringah. Can they take out the shoot shield? That'll be a superb game, no doubt about that. Warringah, I think, Jim, are my favourites. They've just been superb. They're unbeaten. The Rats are at home, and I just think they look a little bit too good today. Probably Brett Sheen might be the difference. When we arrived, I remember just looking at the crowd and seeing it was just absolutely choppers, and everyone was just going nuts, and just kept growing and growing. And it's special because you probably know 90% of the crowd. Exactly, that's, that's true. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, just, it. it's just nuts. Look at the crowd out here. Look at that. Isn't it a great sight to see at a club rugby game? Good afternoon, Jim. This is what they're going to be playing for. The Shoot Shield, named after Robert Shoot, who was tragically killed in a match in 1922. He was a university player back then. And so this Shoot Shield has been contested since 1923. And one club that isn't on it and has never been on it, as you've mentioned earlier in the program, is the Rats. But today is their chance to make history in what is a very historic Shield, They're playing the most historic club in Sydney Uni. And I'm an old uni boy, but today I'm going to have to go for the Rats. They deserve it. We had so many experiences on this ground where Sydney have come from behind and knocked us off right on the bell. I felt like we needed to start well, and we really did. We came out firing. Trying to get the pump up in midfield with Edie and Craig Sayre thereabouts. That's Sheehan, that's his game. He needs the support play. He's got it now off Raymond and a chance here with Willoughby. Go straight, there's the line, and he's in. The forwards again, I tell you, doesn't matter in this team who they are. Tight forwards, front rowers, they can catch and pass. And it's an underrated skill. Got to chase it, folks. Oh, Sheehan on play. Are they having a laugh after that collision? Sheehan says, it wasn't me, it was him. He knocked on. Well worked back line right move. Palu, here he goes. Crunch, crunch, over. He's the man for the job. Let's face it. He smashed through a brick wall, that bloke. Oh, they're on the ball again, Moringa. This is how they started the game. Have they got the finish in the last 20 minutes? The crowd really want to help them get over the line. The composed play. Don't give away a penalty there. Kelly. Oh. Oh, defence, defence. Josh Carr. Josh was up right into him. And look at this. Palu's away. He's in. He's going to score. They won't stop him. Another try to Cliff Palu as Inman comes across. Oh, what a try. Out of nowhere. Cliff Palu. Oh. I think the crowd are happy. I'm glad but they want to place the roof, Brett, because it's coming down. He's loving it. It has been a wonderful afternoon, hasn't it? Oh. Been a highlight of the season. Tremendous game. And now Warringah, two minutes away from claiming their first shoot shield. Don't go to the side. Been living again. They've lost it. And Sheen! They dropped it, knocked it on, and Sheeny picked it up and took off. Then he was gone. Finish it up. What a way for Warringah to finish. Oh, they're on the park. The crowd. The crowd are All the players, we all jumped on top of him, and then the crowd came on top of him. Uh, top yeah, of stacks on. Just, yeah, I remember good. little kids get stacks on as well, like right on the top of the pile. I was one of the rat bags that ran on the field and jumped onto the rats boys even before the final whistle had gone. We're so excited to see any type of premiership come to a ring. You've never seen a prouder man than me standing up there on that hill that day. Mate, you can tell with the crowd here today how important it is for the Warringah club to, to pick up this shoot shield. Yeah. Mate, anyone who said club rugby's dead, there were eight to 10,000 people here going off their nuts, so it was awesome. And it means a lot to the local people and all those guys in the 10, the Ellie Bennett's and Billy Simpsons who've come down, it means a lot. Even the shield, when it got presented, massive crowd around us. Tree held it up and then we all got together as a team and sung the song. There was hundreds and 
hundreds of people singing it at the same time. It was an amazing, unforgettable moment. Everyone was just overwhelmed with happiness and excitement. It was a truly amazing day. Just seeing guys my dad had played with, or guys that had been a part of the club for a long time, crying and cuddling. Everyone from Manly to Palm Beach and beyond, they were so proud. It made you feel how lucky you were just to be part of that team and part of that moment, because it just felt so special. That doesn't happen very often. Setting up the future even meant a younger coach. Former player and local boy Sam Harris was perfect. I knew that I wanted to coach and I was hoping that there was an opportunity for me here at Warringa. I had a chat to Lance Walker about my vision, what I wanted to achieve, and the next year he gave me the opportunity. Came into first grade head coach and was now coaching players that I was playing with the year before. And I'm not sure if it was hard or not because I didn't know any better. But what I did know is I had their respect and what I was going to do was work as hard as I could to make them better and to try and build a club that was going to be really tight. Just brought it right back to what rugby's all about, playing with the boys, playing for each other and having a good time after the game. Whenever we scored a try, Sam Harris wanted to have 15 people in the camera frame every single time. No matter where you were, get around it, high fives and bum taps. This is what a ring is about, is you know, progressing people to the next level, so I'm forever grateful for that and I owe so much to this club. Twenty seventeen was without a doubt the most emotional year for the Rats community. Events both on and off the rugby field impacted the year. No one knew if the club could even withstand the grief of the passing of Lockie Ward. The club was so affected. But everyone banded together as never before and came out infinitely stronger. It was Lockie's trademark positive energy which gave everyone that strength to move forward. Oh, the Rats were absolutely superb today, Cam. A famous victory. They'll go off to the grand final next week in North Sydney Oval. For me, the semi-final win against Manly was the most important part. The crowd were very emotional, the players were very emotional, and that was a combination of not only making the grand final, but also beating Manly. But once we got the players back to the change rooms, the mood was quite level-headed and focused. I was very impressed with how quickly the boys got on to the point of uh, there was one more to go. It didn't feel like a normal Manly Rats win, much more like that box has been ticked and we had one more job to do. Our season for these guys this year was an intense spike. We had the added emotional energy and drive that Lachlan's passing had given to the group and how it had bonded the group even further. Sam was always known as a hard-hitting, straight up and down, hard-carrying number eight. He's grown to become a trusted and tactically respected leader of the team. Off the field, we all know what he's been through. And not much more needs to be said on that. How he's handled this, it's an inspiration to us all. I never wanted to win anything for anyone else more than I want to do for Sam and the family tomorrow. Sam is our inspirational and spiritual captain. Sam Walker. What a crowd we've got here at North Sydney Oval. They're shutting the gates at 15,000. I reckon there's more here. The Northern Beaches, they've come together and they've packed a hill in their droves to support the Warringa Rats this afternoon. And we're just focused on us and we're going to rip in and, and do it for Lockie. There is Sam Ward's younger brother, Lockie Ward, tragically taken far too soon whilst playing for his beloved Warringa Rats. Whether you're a believer or not, you'd have to be pretty churlish to deny the possibility that he is here today cheering on his big brother and his beloved Warringa Rugby Club. I have tingles, mate. This is amazing as we watch Warringa take the field. 2017, easily one of the greatest years in Shoot Shield history. And what a moment it is for the Warringa Rats after such an emotional 
12 months to now be in the grand final and a chance to compete for the championship. Ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding to observe a moment's silence for Billy Simpson, who passed away last night. Billy was our oldest living Waratah, a life member of the New South Wales Rugby Union and the founder of the Warringah Rugby Club. The moment silence, uh, it was an opportunity for the boys to reflect on, on what's been an incredibly emotional year for us. We had Lockie's passing, but also uh, the work that Billy did for, to set out the club and then for him to pass the day before the grand final was a tragic loss. Billy will be sorely missed by all in the rugby community. And some well-deserved respect for Mr Billy Simpson. Of course, we send our sympathies to Billy's friends and family. And we know that he's here in spirit today with Lockie Ward. Sam Ward. What an incredibly emotional year it's been for him, but he is such a major part of this team. You see the initials of Lockie Ward on the field. Seb Wildman with the ball in hand. <laughs> All the Warringah Rats are underway in the 2017 Shoot Shield Grand and Final, but quick knock on by Northern Suburbs. Warringah gets early possession. Grand finals are crazy things. You've got to keep your emotions and the adrenaline in check. The first 20 minutes, it's going to be helter-skelter stuff, but you've just got to stay composed and not get too overawed by the situation. The Rats looking for the first try. Holmes fires it out to O'Connor. O'Connor's over for the first five-pointer of the grand final. Holmes, a lovely ball from Josh Holmes. And Rory O'Connor was in the perfect position, and they weren't going to stop the big loose head pop from only three metres out, Chef. Well, what an incredible start for the Warringah Rats. The physicality and the speed of the game has been electric. Both these two sides, experts, are just suffocating their opponent. Up goes Sam Thompson, takes it clean. McQueen Jones offloads to Rory O'Connor. Back it comes for Josh Holmes now. Round the corner comes Sam Ward. Over he goes. He's done it. He's done it, the big number eight. He scored a try in the grand final for his little brother. Oh, that's sensational to see. Big Sam Ward around the corner, and he would not be denied. He just runs with so much passion and so much heart. Norths need to be patient. That was Luxton, now it goes to Harry Bury. No way past Tangy Thacking Bow. No, oh, he smashed him. Oh, there's the try. There's the try for Ezra, Ezra Luxton. Well, it was always going to be very hard for the Warringah Rats to hold out Norths after losing Tom Connor. It's these little moments that always change and decide grand finals. Which one will we be talking about on Monday? Don't touch him. Duffy reaches in there and claims it. Little kick by Snar. Slow, it's been picked up by Tompkins. Out it goes to Hamish Angus. Needs to get it to Feltshire. Oh, Dave Feltshire's got the pace to go all the way, does he? Harry Jones on the inside. And with the flying touchdown, Harry Jones scores for the Ringer Rats. They go left this time. Big Jack Tompkins. Oh, lovely ball. Uh, work getting away to Harry Jones. Jones now looking for the try. Over he goes for his second, Harry Jones. Well, that was sensational. They're going try for try here at North Sydney. Oh, an unbelievable little run of play here. Both teams throwing absolutely everything they have at each other. Fury back to Sinclair. Oh, gets it out to Lockatui. Needs to make the pass. He does. Clay for the corner. Lockie Clay goes over in the corner for Norman Summers. 25-27. Kick to come for the Shawman. Oh, what a game this is, this 2017 Grand Final. <laughs> that ball was the difference. We've got a Grand Final on our hands, boys. The Warringah bench is standing. Look at the emotion, the anxiety. So close to their dream of winning the Intra Super Shoot Shield. But a tough decision now for Warringah to make. Do they keep the pressure on and go for the try, or do they take the gift three? Well, three points will give them a five-point lead, which means if North scores and converts, they'll Shot. lose. In this great game of rugby, they're the decisions you have to make, Tone. 
This will be the last play of the game. chance Norths have is to win a tight head. Josh Holmes gets the ball. Back it goes to Hamish Angus. Hit. The Moringa Rats have won the grand final for 2017 in the Intrust Super Shoot Shield. Riding a wave of emotion for their friend and teammate Lachlan Ward who must surely be here in spirit watching his big brother and beloved Moringa Rats. It's been one hell of a ride for the Moringa Rats in 2017. So much tragedy, but now sheer jubilation. Can't believe it. I've honestly speechless. It's the best, best rugby moment of my life. Look at the boys in there now. Well, they are 2017 champions. They gave it their 110% like they always do. They're a superbly confident, well-coached outfit. But the passion of the Moringa Rats, I think, got them home. They just fought as they have all year. They banded together when the going got tough. And when it really counted, they made sure that they took advantage of their opportunities. Accepting the Intrust Super Shoot Shield from Brendan O'Farrell and David Begg, Sam Ward and Hamish Angus, hoisting it skyward. The 2017 champions, the Warringah Rats. legacy so far is a deep one. It's not all about football, but families and service to our community. And of course, the club will continue to grow and evolve, but never forget our beginnings. Bill always said he would never smoke his cigar until we won a first grade premiership. And I look forward to the day we all smoke a cigar in his memory. Every year we get better at what we do, and it's about being a whole club. It's not good enough just to think about first grade winning anymore. First grade stands on the shoulders of all the other players. We want every player that walks in to understand that we're here for them, to try and make them the best player they can possibly be, get to the highest level they can, and pass on some of the ethos to be the best people they can. As someone that came from the Scottish borders, it was hard for me to just to beaches, laid back attitude to turning it on and really being tough and really proud of, of playing for the club but that's what I experienced and that's what the club has known throughout, throughout the world. You can talk about all the great games, to me the highlight is being friendship and that's that sense of being part of Moringa Rugby Club. The club is more than just your performance on the field. No one remembers how many games you played. They remember who you are as a person and the fun times and the moments you share. That's what is important, that this club will always support you for the rest of your life. If you look now, everyone stays back after the game. And that's a sign that they want to be here and participate in whatever we can give them. If we're not playing, we're coaching. And then if we're not coaching, we're bringing our sons or our daughters back through the juniors. We keep together and communicate to make the club bigger and better. You don't get that at very many clubs. Once I retire, I'll be back here helping the club out as best I can in any way I can. I look at Ringa at the moment as a very successful club. And this has been brought all about by fundamental Grassroots rugby being able to progress naturally. I wanted to see it go another 50. From where I was as a head coach to where it is now is unbelievable. They're just in control of their own destiny. No matter what New South Wales Rugby Union or Sydney Rugby Union do, the ring is always going to be in a strong position. For me, being a rat is about being at home with my mates. The friendship, the passion that we all share, it's about treating each other, whatever our ability, the same. We all get in and do it together. We train hard together 
and we party hard together. The simple things, singing the song after a win or with the friends that you make because you still see them now. My heart and soul of rugby, where I learnt to put my entire being on the line for my teammate so that a group of other women could win a championship, have just so much fun and be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. You have your day job nine to five, but this is a passion. And there's not much in your life apart from your loved ones and your family that can give you that sort of passion. To have that family, you just play harder for each other, you look after each other. I just love putting that white jumper on. It just changed you. Every time you ran onto the field with the green and white jersey on, with your mates around you, you absolutely knew you were going to be competitive and you were going to give it your best shot. Standing shoulder to shoulder with your mates and making sure you go together. Ringer will always be ringer and attract the people you have. As long as you've got that jersey on, you know that all of those guys will do anything to make sure you're okay. Whatever happens to the club, we can't lose that. The players we've got the attitude down here now about training. We've eclipsed all the negative things that boys used to look at. Now it's go out there and do it and get it done. As a club, we'll go from strength to strength and being a players club, let the players make their own decisions and just let the family run the business. If I can keep coming down here when I'm older and there's a live band in the clubhouse afterwards, then I'll, I'll be a happy guy. The club will just grow and grow. We can only get better and better and better. People have become a bit disenchanted with rugby in general. I think there's an opportunity here for the club to capitalise on that and bring people back to the grassroots of the game where they come down to Rat Park on a Saturday afternoon and actually watch a good game of footy. The local club rugby, it is still pure footy. It's a network of people that you know and trust over time and through great experiences with one another. We really can become that sporting hub of the Northern Beaches and we can drive kids back to playing sport on Saturdays. Right from the juniors all the way through, I think it's in a really healthy position at the moment. The thing that's really important for me is for Warringah to keep its traditions of being a family club, its traditions of being a club that respects the opposition and isn't siege mentality. We're no longer the new club on the block. We're a club that's done very, very well and we should be very proud of that. Coming back into the change room and seeing all these photos of players I've played with, watched and coached, it's great to see. It's not only been a place for me to enjoy, but a lot of other generations as well. Moringa always had that feel that anyone could walk in here and everyone would say, good day, come and join us. Get on, do your best. And that, that's the way uh, rugby should be played. And that's the spirit in this club. Ringa Rugby Club is an organisation which has never gone backward. This is bound and put in words near the flagstaff. Anybody should read this when they go to Rat Park. This memorial is dedicated to the rats of Trebrook, the men who didn't give in, and to all those men and women who served Australia in the Boer War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Malaysia, Vietnam, and UN peacekeeping missions. Warringah Rugby Club has adopted the ethos of the men who didn't give in, lest we forget. So there it is, Warringah goes to the outright lead. They are unbeaten from Warringah Rugby Park. It's good afternoon from Gordon Bray and Trevor Allen.